Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. I am so glad that you are with us as we begin a new series entitled Trinity, and I am really, really excited about these next number of weeks that we're going to take a look at this. Just before we jump into the message for today, a couple of updates I wanted to give to you. Last week was Easter Sunday. It was a great day um, around here, and for the first time, we let you know about the opportunity to um, give toward Ukraine, and there are going to be three ways to get involved. One is to donate money for food. Food. That food will be purchased there, and they put together pallets of food that get loaded into vans and trucks and make their way eventually to the front lines. And then also to donate medical supplies, and those also, they will be carried in person by people who are going to help hand deliver those supplies, and that will be in Poland, and then they too eventually will get to the front lines. And in the video that we shot over there, we let you know about those pallets of food that are being put together, and the cost of a pallet is about $800. And when I was over there with our video guy, Sean, I said, I'll bet you we could, you know, get 20 pallets of food, you know? And I thought, wow, that'd be something. Oh, me of little faith. Can I tell you what you guys did just last week? And you can continue. Those envelopes are there in the chair in front of you, um, and we'll collect that till the team goes. But you gave enough for 50 pallets of food. <laughs> incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of that. And again, we're going to collect until that team goes and uh, everything in those envelopes is going to go to that, to purchasing food um, that is in such desperate need over there. And also on Easter Sunday across this whole campus here with children and students and adults, uh, we talked about who Jesus is, about his life, death, and on that day, especially we focus on the resurrection, uh, his coming back from the dead and the difference that makes. And we invited people across the whole campus to say yes to Jesus and to step into a relationship with him. And can we just celebrate something? Because whenever God does that, that's his doing and not ours. Last week, some 86 people said yes to Jesus. Can we just celebrate that? Go, God. <laughs> so let's turn our attention um, to the message for today, Trinity. And if you're familiar with that word at all, it is one of the things around which I've been asked a lot of questions over all the years that I've been doing what I do as a pastor, because it's one of those concepts that there is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all existing as God eternally, not three God, three in one, there is one God, and yet there are three persons in it can be mind-blowing and hard to get our arms around it. And I recognize that there is some mystery and some challenge in what we're going to talk about over the next number of weeks. So to maybe get us started a little bit, I used all of my um, artistic ability to create a little bit of an illustration for you here. And here goes. <laughs> so uh, imagine for a moment... If you were going to enter a two-dimensional world, we live in a three-dimensional world, but you, all you had was up and down and left and right, and there was no depth, right? And so in this image, you know, this is me in the middle, you can tell by the hair, and I've lost a little bit of weight um, in that two-dimensional world. And imagine what it's like coming from our three-dimensional world and entering this two-dimensional world and trying to tell somebody else what it's like. And you can even, you know, take a simple object like a ball and just try to describe, you know, this is a circle, but in the three-dimensional world, there are balls and they're round. Well, that's round. Yeah, but a ball is different. It, it, it has, you know, depth to it and, and weight and mass. And so are there circles within the circle? And there's just a built-in sense of challenge when it comes to communicating something that is beyond the categories of that world. Well, we're going to be talking about a God who is beyond 
the human categories. And when you talk about a God who is eternal, here we are as finite human beings. And when you think about eternity, can you wrap your mind around eternity? You know, that the line stretches in both directions without end, and we, you know, have a hard time conceiving that. Can we think about, you know, infinity? And can we think about a time when, you know, time did not exist and the category wasn't even um, in place? And we're going to be trying to understand and comprehend what the Bible reveals about the character and nature of God over the next couple of weeks. And that's really a good place to start. You know, here at Washington Heights, we believe um, that the Bible reveals the truth to us. It reveals reality about God, about ourselves, about the world in which we live. And what we'll discover over the next three weeks, and we're going to take a look one at a time, is how the Bible reveals God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to be eternally God. No one became God. No one, you know, achieved Godhood. They have existed that way for all of eternity. Let's take a look just at one starting point here today. And it says, then God said, this is in Genesis chapter 1, at the beginning of creation, God has made these planets and the stars and so many other things, but has not yet created humanity. He's just about to do that. And so now God is speaking, let us, who is he talking to? He's not talking, you know, to the planets and the stars. He's talking to himself in the plural. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And we begin to see this incredible mystery about a God who is beyond the human categories. And what it begins to picture for us is that God is this community that there has been relationship within who God is and is a part of his very nature. So let's talk about a definition right up front. What does Trinity mean? You will not find that word in your Bible. It's a theological word used to describe what the Bible reveals to us about the reality, the character, the nature of God. There is one God, Bible's real clear about that, who exists as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are each fully and equally God. And if you say, wow, that is really hard to wrap my head around all of that, you're exactly in the right place. And I don't know about you, but I would, you know, kind of conclude this, that if God could fit all of my categories and I could understand God completely, I would be worried, right? Because... I would think at that point, you know what? I probably created that if it just makes sense to me and just fits into all the categories that I have. That if we talk about an awesome, infinite, totally holy God, it's got to be bigger than the categories that somebody who is not those things has within himself. But we often think logically, and so sometimes we think this, well, isn't one plus one plus one, doesn't that equal three? I mean, we learned that, you know, way back uh, once upon a time. Well, here's also what we learned, and it's a little different. Multiplication says one times one times one is one. So when is one and one and one not three? Well, when it's one. And the Bible says they're one, there's one God, three persons. But it's one in three, and it is three in one, and it is, on some level, a mystery that has incredible implications um, of what it means to follow the God of the Bible. So let's take a look at some of those implications, some of the big picture. So, so what that God is this triune God and that that relationship exists? What's the big deal? And begins with something that we might not think about as being an important understanding about God, and that is that God is relational. That there has been this existence of relationship for all of eternity, God did not create humanity because he was lonely and needed people to walk with him and honor him and worship him. And some of the things that we might think might be the motivation for why God created. Because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been in this mutual relationship of deference, of submission to one another, of glorifying one another. It isn't about me, it is about them, and it is reciprocal, and it is this beautiful picture of relationship and love that has been in existence 
since before there was anything as we know it. And the picture of this, we see it a number of times in the Bible. Let me just show you one. This is at Jesus' baptism. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he, Jesus, went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so you have God the Father, you have Jesus the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit that's present. At the beginning of Jesus going public with his work of redemption, of redeeming and restoring broken humanity into a relationship with God. Do you know the other time when those same uh, images are present? It's way back at the beginning of the Bible when God is going to create. The first verse in the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So there you see God. And God speaks. There is this word of God that goes out from him. In the book of John, it tells us the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Who is that? That's Jesus. He's there. And it says that his spirit hovered over the waters. And so at the beginning of creation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the beginning of the work of redemption and restoration, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are present in this picture of a God who is fully involved in reaching down to broken humanity. Here's the way that C.S. Lewis, he's one of the smartest theologians from the last century. He spent much of his life as an atheist, didn't believe there was a God at all. Well, he winds up becoming a follower of Jesus, and he also wrestled with this idea and tried to put, you know, some understanding around this idea of a triune God. In Christianity, God is not an impersonal thing, nor a static thing, not even just one person, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, kind of drama almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance, a kind of dance. The pattern of this three-person life is the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. In the early church, there were some theologians, and they put a word around this. They called it perichoresis. We get our word choreography from that. What do you put choreography to? A dance. I'm not going to dance for you. I come from the Germanic people. We were not made to dance. Those are the people that gave the world the chicken dance. That's pretty much all you need to know about how well Germans move in sync and rhythm, and it's not very pretty. But there's this idea that there has been this kind of dance in the very heart of God, the character and the nature of God. And it's not just that we can think, okay, well, that's in God. It is reflected in everything that he has made. Where there is this mutual give and take, this symbiotic relationship that is mutually beneficial to everybody who is a part of it. And there's a mystery to it as well. My guess is way back in science class, we all learned about, you know, the sun is in the center of our galaxy and all the planets make their way around it. And that's a pretty cool thing all by itself. But the picture that we learned is not exactly right. I mean, you check out, you know, a video like this and this is kind of what we were taught. And I think, man, that's cool that they do that on a regular basis and somehow there are forces at work that put all those things in motion and keep them exactly where they are supposed to be. But recent discoveries have said, no, that is way too static. That is way too boring. That is not accurate. It actually looks more like this, where the sun is in motion and the planets are moving in sync and in time. And it is even more dynamic. And you can just kind of picture this, this dance, this choreography, even on a macro level in the universe in which we live. And there's even a reality at which we don't even understand everything that makes this work. That there are forces at play that we have yet to unearth, unpack and discover. But it all works. And yet we don't even fully know why. There's some kind of a mystery to it. And a lot of the theologians refer to it as this dance 
the very expression of the character and nature of God. Here's something, and I kind of geek out on some science stuff. I don't understand half the stuff I'm reading, but I like it anyway. Um, And it talks about how there are these principles in our universe about how some things work together. And the leading scientists of our time say, it shouldn't all work based on what we know. It shouldn't all hang together, and yet it does. Now, Richard Dawkins, one of the smartest people from the last century, he made this statement. He said, there is something behind it all that we have not yet discovered that makes it all fit together in ways that we don't yet understand. He called that thing the theory of everything. That there's something behind everything that we know that makes it all work. But right now, from what we understand, it shouldn't work. But there is this incredible dance, this choreography that is just woven into the creation. And that's on a macro level. But you know what? It's on a micro level too. Cosmologists and physicists now believe that everything that exists began as light. And light is an interesting thing all by itself. Light has magnetic waves, it has an electric wave, and it has particles, this three in one. And we don't even fully know how it works because it it functions differently in different settings, and yet there it is, and there's a bit of a mystery to it, but it works. And why is it interesting that even cosmologists say that everything began as light? In the very beginning of the creation story, what's the first thing God said? Let there be light light. And so even woven into the very fabric of everything that has been made is this beautiful picture, not of something static, not of something that just lays there, but of this dance, this choreography. And we don't even understand it all, but there it is. On a cell level, you know, we used to think that cells were these simple bits of plasma or that kind of eventually, you know, turned into more complex things, right? The theory of evolution says we move from simple to complex. We know better now that even on a molecular level that there is complexity woven into the smallest things that we can see. For a long time, we didn't even know there was such a thing as an atom, And now we know, and you probably learned about those too, and there's protons and neutrons and electrons, these three in one that are just the building blocks of of life itself. And even there, we don't understand it all. And yet woven into the fabric of everything that is, is this dance, this give and take, this relationship And even right now, you know, you and I are breathing in and out and we're giving and we're taking and it's just part of the fabric of everything that we know. And so the implications, you know, God is relational. And we see that everywhere and really in everything. And what does that mean? It means that life is more about relationships than anything else. That relationships are such an expression of a God who is a community of persons. And why did God then create? Why did he even make what he made? And sometimes we might think, well, God, you know, was lonely. But here's what the Bible says. God is love. It doesn't say God is loving. He's that as well. But it says that God is love. It also doesn't say that love is God. It says that God is love. That's part of his character, part of his nature, part of the heart of God. But think about this. If there is not a community that is God, there would not have been love until anything was created because if God was only a uni person, love needs to be given and received and it could not have been done so. But the Bible says no for all of eternity. That's what's been unfolding in this relationship called the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in mutual loving relationship for all time. Love existed far before anything was ever made. So then why did God create? Not because he was lonely. Not because he needed people to honor him and worship him and walk with him. It's because he wanted to share that with us. To express the heart of God to people. And when Jesus came, What he tried to do 
through the things that he taught and the reality that he shared was to try to get us in tune with the kingdom of God and the reality of the way that God has made things. And sometimes that runs against who we are because the Bible says we come into this world and our souls are bent and broken at the deepest level. And we're not plugged in to the giver of life. But that's why Jesus came. And that's why he said things like this. You want to gain your life? Well, then give it away. Well, where would that come from? From a God that is a community that does not seek to be the center, but rather to honor and glorify another. Jesus says, you want to lose your life? Well, then hang on to it. And he was trying to get us in touch with the reality of just the way things are in the character of nature of God in the world itself, the world in which we live. But when we're unplugged from God, would you agree that it's really easy to get self-centered and to make it about me, myself, and I? And we can even take the good things that are in this world and we can twist them and turn them in our direction. I'll give you one example. Maybe you're familiar with a book called The Five Love Languages. Really good book. Came out a number of years ago now. Still has a lot of traction there. Helped a lot of marriage relationships. And I remember Sally and I um, reading through that. And you get a little bit of a test to see which of the five love languages you have. We both came out with acts of service. And how easy it is to say, you know what? My act of service barrel is a little bit low today, Sally. Serve me. Right? It's meant to be given, not received, but we can take something even so good and so helpful and we can twist it and turn it into our own direction. And humanity is really good that when we are not in tune with who God is and the way he made things, we make it ultimately about ourselves. Right? Build my kingdom with me at the center. Right? I show up at work and I give orders and people respond to that, and they do what I tell them. That's my kingdom with me at the center. And people in relationships, I do what they, what to tell them what to do, and they bend their will to mine, and it's my kingdom and me at the center. I walk into a home, and the slippers are set out, and there's a nice tea on the, on the end table. What does that represent? That represents that I walked into the wrong home. Um, <laughs> it is remarkably easy for us to make it about ourselves. Another amazing trait that you see universally is that people chase after things. Have you noticed this? And we're looking for something or maybe it's a someone to satisfy us, to fill us up, to be the ultimate solution to that ache, that yearning, that hunger that we have inside of ourselves. Maybe we pursue a career, we pursue fame, we pursue fortune, we pursue maybe sex, we pursue all kinds of different things. Why? Why is that? Could it be that maybe we are pursuing what we were made for? And on some level, we recognize the hunger, but we put all the wrong things into that space. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, concept called phantom pain. It's often experienced by service people who in battle or in some sort of accident, they lose a limb or a portion of a limb. And to experience phantom pain, you know, that maybe a portion of that limb is gone, but the mind tells you know, us, that there is pain there, and so we feel pain in something that no longer exists. But in order to have phantom pain, you had to have it at some point. It had to be your possession, and now you've lost it. It's just a hypothesis, but I wonder, in all the things that we chase after, could it be that maybe what that is is phantom pain of the soul? as we search for what we were made for, isn't the ultimate question, why are we even here? What is the purpose of my life? And maybe in the pursuit of all those things, we, we sense the hunger, and then there's a God who came to tell us the reality of what we were made for and what will truly satisfy our souls. G.K. Chesterton great theologian, he made this statement, and when I first heard it, it shocked me a little bit because it didn't sound right. 
He said, every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is searching for God. And when I first heard it, I'm thinking, boy, those dots are pretty far apart to connect those things. How does that work? But what he was talking about was this idea, right? That hunger, that pursuit, that thing that is going to ultimately satisfy me. And in some way, we know that we're missing something. But we had to have it in order to feel that sort of phantom pain. Here's the way the book of Ecclesiastes describes it. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. It's like we know it on some level. Yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And so we search. And yet there's Jesus, God in the flesh, who stepped out of heaven, came to this world, in order to show us what we were made for, who we were made for. And ultimately, that dance and that relationship and that God who has existed in an eternal, beautiful relationship of love wants to share that with us. There's another way to say that. We were created for the dance. We were made for that. And what our hearts are longing for is that. And there's a God whose very character and nature is that. And he made you and he made me to share that with us. And Jesus came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Because we might think, okay, well then let me work my way back into the dance. Let me learn some dancing steps and get in sync with the music and work my way back onto the dance floor. But the reality is, the Bible says, spiritually speaking, we're on the floor dead. And what can a dead person do? And the answer is nothing. But that's why Jesus came. And there's one chapter in a book called uh, Ephesians. We don't have the time to look at it here this morning. But it talks about how God the Father chose you. And Jesus came to redeem you. And the Holy Spirit made you alive. And so when we step into that relationship with God, who did that? A triune God who loves you like no other and came to invite you to the dance for which you are made. And if you've already stepped across that line of faith and trust and you go, okay, so then what? Well, remember what we said, that life is more about relationships than anything else. That's one of the great reasons why we do something here at Washington Heights called small groups. Because we were made for relationships and we have them at home and we have them at work and we have them in our community. That's great. There's an opportunity for us to connect and to grow and to be in that same sort of picture, that same sort of dance, that same sort of gift that God has given to us, the relationship, the kinds that we were made for. You were invited to dance with God. You were invited to dance with others. It's what you were made for. Would you bow your heads together with me? And God, again, I would just ask that you would expand our understanding, our comprehension, our sense of who you are. May there be awe when we think about your greatness, your holiness, your power, your grace, all of it, because it's all a gift from you that you long to share with us. And you have done everything necessary so that we could walk with you. And so God, may you be at the center of all things. And may we recognize that we were made for you. And you've given us so many great things to enjoy in these lives of ours. May it all be to your honor and to your glory. 
And so God, on this day, we thank you for who you are and for what we can know and understand about the way things really are. And thank you uh, for the heart of God that is unlike anything we can know. And we sang before, it's extravagant. And sometimes it's even unthinkable to understand how much you have truly loved us. And so we ask that you would draw us closer to you and help us to journey with you all the more. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.